All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming down. Um, before we get into Ember London proper, I'll hand over to our very gracious host. Hello, everyone. Hi. How are you guys? Was the pizza okay? Hey. I know it's Domino's. It's not like proper hipster pizza. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm Tom Cowell. I lead our front-end development team here uh, in London for Sapien Nitro. Uh, yes, we've just been acquired by Publicis. No, we will not be speaking French during this, uh, requiring French for this time. Um, so uh, Sapien is an organization. We've been around for quite a while. We like big technology, interesting technology. We also do marketing services stuff. So you may know some things we've done, marksandspencers.com. Yes, you're not buying your knickers there, gentlemen. Uh, but uh, you know that's one of the sites we built. We work with big financial services, um, Harley Davidson, F1, kind of organizations like that as well. Um, we're not hiring at the moment, so next month maybe come ask me. Um, and then just as sort of an order of detail, if you do need to use the toilets, they're out the doors you came in and across from the middle lift through those doors there. Um, if you're locked out, go back to uh, security. You've all got bracelets, right? I don't have a bracelet because I work here. Um, but if you've got bracelets, they'll let you back in if you get locked out. Um, if the fire alarm goes, um, I will generally scream running out of the room and I expect everyone to follow. Um, and uh, if you guys have any questions about Sapien or anything else like that, feel free to come talk to me afterwards. Um, and then I'll let Jamie fill in the rest of the blanks. Okay, thank you, Tom. Okay, so uh, to begin with, does anyone in the room have any announcements? Is anyone hiring? Yes? Uh, we are everywhere looking for Ember developers. Okay, so go see Vidas if you want to talk about that. Yeah, I'm James. Uh, I work at a company called Dentally. We're an online dental software. Uh, we use Ember. Uh, we love Ember. If you like Ember, and like using Ember, Come and speak to me. <laughs> awesome. Anybody else? Uh, we are off of fetch gas. Mm -hmm. We are probably looking for uh, seven or eight developers. Seven or eight. For, so, yeah. Okay. So another place to go see. So you'll have time to meet all these people in between the talks and afterwards at the pub. So this is what today's lineup looks like. It's me rambling to begin with, and then Nikki's going to talk to us about accessibility. Miguel is going to talk to us about mobile web apps, and Rob is going to talk to us about native and the web, and whether, whether the web can be anything like as fast as native. Uh, I'll give you a quick bit of Ember London news. We have actually 597 people on our meetup group now, for whatever that's worth. Uh, obviously, that doesn't mean all those people come to every meetup, but it's a nice number to have. We've recorded 38 talks so far. There'll be three more at the end of today, and we've had over 11,000 plays on Vimeo, which I'm pretty proud of. That's in the last year. Uh, January's project night was a real success. So if you don't know about these, um, the week after we do the meetups, we do a project night, and that's just an excuse to come and hack with some other Ember developers for an evening on whatever you want to. Bring your own project, work with somebody else on their project. Um, we provide food and a space to do it in, and so far it's been, it's, it's been a lovely atmosphere. And the last project night in January resulted in a pull request which fixed a big bug that loads of people had in Ember CLI. So you can get open source work done too. Uh, our sponsor was Wingman. Our next sponsor is Raygun. They're sponsoring next week's project night. Um, I'll go over the dates in a slide or two. Or one slide. So uh, yeah, next Thursday is February's project night as sponsored by Raygun. The March meetup will be 3rd to the 12th of March, and the March project day will be Sunday 22nd. So we've got, um, we've got a bit more sponsorship in March and room to do a little bit more. So the idea of the project day is if weeknights are difficult, which they are for people with young families and people in situations like that, or people who are coming from out of town, <coughs> then we're going to run a full day event where you're not obliged to stay for the entire day. Just come for as much as you want just to learn some stuff and work with some other people. Um, we have a forum. Uh, I hope you'll sign up and use it. Uh, we use it to talk about the meetups and to continue discussions that we start at the meetups. We also use it as a way to, um, if you want to get help, but you don't want to deal with the time zone difference between the US and here, or you know, other people you might be able to get help from, this is another Ember community where you can get help from people who are in the same time zone as you. 
Um, and there's emberlondon.com too. I, I realize now you can't, probably can't read the address there, but this is where this links off to all our other entities. So now I'm going to do uh, just a quick catch up of Ember News. Uh, does this mean anything to anyone? No. Yeah? A couple of. So this was a. Um, this was a TV show in the 90s called uh, Bad Influence, presented by a woman called uh, Violet Berlin. And it was, just, it was like a kid's computer game show, and they did this thing at the end called the Data Blast, which is where, <laughs> where they would play back all the cheat codes you might want to know <laughs> with like two frames each. And the idea was you were meant to uh, tape the show and then pause and step through frames to get all the cheat codes at the end. So my Ember News is modeled after that. <laughs> OK. Um, EmberConf is sold out. Uh, I am told that there are something on the order of 600 people attending. So that's not bad. It was 400 last year. Um, who's heard about this? 625 and ES Next merged last month. So these are two um, ES6 transpiler projects. Uh, ES Next is run by a guy from Square. 625 is its own independent thing. And the guy who was running ES Next decided to combine his knowledge with theirs and now uh, it's a bit like Google Have Tracer, which is their ES6 transpiler. 6 to 5 is a little bit leaner, a little bit more performant, and will give you ES6 features today. Uh, IOJS <laughs> controversially forked off of uh, Node. Uh, they can't use the Node name anywhere, but it's, it's basically all the patches people had wanted to land in Node released as its own project. Uh, it allows you to write ES6 in your server-side JavaScript code. Um, jo Liss is doing Broccoli Thursdays now. So every Thursday she'll be working for a full day on Broccoli to nail down the version 1 features. And on that note, there's now BroccoliJS.com too. So this, this project is getting to the point where it's stable and shored up and can grow steadily with semantic versioning. Uh, I thought this was a nice link. Speak to my co-organizer Ken about this. If you want if you want some data to play with in your Ember apps, there's a boatload here. So go check that out. And if anyone wants to read one of the best articles on a really good pattern for doing flash messages in Ember and various other things, Lauren Tan, who's speaking at EmberConf, blogs about all things Ember on Medium. And these are really in-depth, elegantly composed technical posts. Oh, and Ember Inspector now tells you what of the features you're using are deprecated. Oh, and there's community survey as well. Sorry, I haven't really prepared it apart from doing the slides. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good article too. I'll put these all up later so you can read these. OK, so, um, if it, so hands up who's using Ember day to day in the room. That's about half. And who's used it at all? OK? And some, some people will be brand new to it, but uh, the Ember has a six-week release cycle. So a new minor version gets cut every six weeks and features whatever the, the new fully cooked pending features are. So Ember 1.10 just landed, and I thought I'd go through some of the stuff that landed with it. So I'll show you how to upgrade it first. So those, those slides are an Ember app. And I will shut it down quickly. So. Ember 1.10 is interesting because it's the point at which um, HTML bars, the more advanced replacement for the templating engine handlebars, lands for real. So in order to install it, we'll go for install Ember 1.10 itself. Oh, oh yeah, this problem. Uh, oh. I think it's just uh, the way Bower works. I will connect to my own phone. That's probably going to work. Oh, come on. There we go. Some, like, elevator music, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> come on. Come on, Jamie, sing us a song. <sighs> Can I ask a question there while it's waiting? Yes. <laughs> is running this on IOJS a bit faster than IOJS? Is there a performance difference in compiling? I don't think it's faster. It's slower, isn't it? It might be slower, yeah. 
the reason I'm running on IOJS is it's a. Uh, God, that's fast. Woo wee. OK, cool. Um, so, installing Ember 110 alone isn't the full story. Now that Ember 110 is the point where we switch from handlebars to HTML bars, so we need to also remove the old template compiler from Ember CLI and add the new one. So, let's see, npm. Yeah, so I'm using IOJS uh, in support of a later slide where I demonstrate that Ember CLI does in fact work on IOJS, as, as you can see. Okay, so so that was the upgrade process. So just to show you, whoops, so show you the diff for that. There's not too much to it. You swap out Ember and you swap out the template compiler. And you can actually ditch handlebars at that point. So previously, you had to include the, ha include the handlebars <laughs> runtime, a few extra kilobytes of JavaScript in your app. Now you can, you can drop that all together. So, um, so chained else blocks. Uh, those who've been using Ember will know that right now you have if else, but no access to else if. So um, in my example here, uh, you'll see that it tells me when it's too short, it tells me when it's right, and it tells me when it's too long. And the way I've implemented it in this app, uh, let's see. Because Ember previously didn't support else if, I've, had to, I've got to have this nested set of conditionals. But now that I'm on Ember 1.10 and HTML bars, The syntax highlighting doesn't work for it yet because it's too new, but if the demo gods are smiling upon me, oh, oh I've heard about this. <laughs> I get the same behavior, but now with a much more elegant and intuitive syntax that you're, that you're used to. Um, block param. So again, anyone who's used Ember previously will know that with things like each, it used to be that each would have its own new scope. And uh, you, it was sort of understood that within an each block, the thing, the item in that iteration would be the, the context of it, would be the this. And then we switch to each something in some things. But now, uh, with HTML bars and Ember 1.10, we get a new syntax, which is, allows you to pass in things into that internal block. So I'll show you what that actually looks like. Um, so previously, it looked like this. Each speaker and speakers. Mm -hmm. Whoops. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> it's playing back itself. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> Oh, God. All right. Tell you what, I'm just going to. Uh, make sure I'm running on the list. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Seems good. All right, so basically the point is um, now there's a uniform way to pass things into a block. So each speaker's as speaker. But the other thing this allows you to do is pass in 
anything you want to in any component that you, can, that you define. So if there were properties of, so you see that there's this DB slide component wrapping around all this stuff. If I wanted to pass in property, if I wanted to pass in stuff that that block ought to know about DB slide, I can do that. So an example would be, um, mm -mm -mm. so where I say yield here, if I say yield this, this in this context is my component, is my DB slide component. So I'll save that and uh, oh, great. Um, I got my machine all set up and then I had to go and do a day's work and change all the configuration. So, uh, so you'll see uh, DB slide is a component, it has a height property. So what this should allow me to do is um, pass in my slide and then what I could probably, hopefully, So it looks a little bit like uh, the block params in Ruby, and it's definitely influenced by that. There you go. So that's a, a bound property that's come from the containing component, and it opens up the door for passing in all sorts of useful properties with components. So if I, if I can, um, let's see, you, pro you hopefully saw 1080 change to yeah. 1008 there. So hopefully nothing too surprising there. Uh, injected properties, right, so hopefully I can demonstrate this without things blowing up. Um, so in this app, uh, I have some services which I want various pieces of the app to know about. And in order to make those pieces aware of those things, I need to inject them, as so we're used to doing in initializers. Um, now, one set introduces a new dependency injection syntax, and it's fairly straightforward. So right now, I'm injecting this keyboard service into the router, and my router happens to have a mix-in in it called root stepper. And this is the thing that needs to know about the keyboard service. So what I'd like to be able to do is just ditch ditch that initializer altogether. So that goes away. And instead, define the keyboard using the new <laughs> syntax. So ember.inject dot service. And so what that says to ember is, at runtime, go find me a service with the name keyboard. So it knows it's keyboard because that's the, the property that you've attached it to. If you wanted it to be a different service to go and find, you could say, you know, whatever you wanted to here, and it would go and find it. Apologies for the, uh, the broken stuff over here. That's a, uh, a bug that accidentally shipped with Ember CLI. All right, so my keyboard still works, and now you don't have to have a separate initializer. You can inject your services any way you want with something much more declarative and much, more, much closer to the, the concept you're actually working with. All right, so uh, 110 has landed, and that means the 111 beta is six weeks away from us. So let's go and install that. Oops. So this should just be a case. Oops. Uh, we're at beta one at the moment. if I don't use up all my mobile bandwidth. Has anyone tried out any of those 110 features yet? I tried the uh, using a bars today, but I remember I had an error saying you can't find this directly to the... can't use that error, but yeah, I was trying to do it with more. Okay. I tried out block parameters, where yep. you can now supply the index of an array. Yes, uh, that, yeah. that would be beautiful. I got rid of so much code. And I tried to say to nest to GL company to add run children components. Yes. <laughs> the pattern I quite like is um, for those who are familiar with Rails, you have the, the form for helper, 
where you get the form, the sort of form object as a, as a block parameter, you can now do the same thing, and that allows you to um, sneak in extra form helpers via that, that form object that you're passing in as a block param. Or indeed, um, it gives you quite a nice pattern for getting around the situation where you want to feed a model into a form, but you don't want edits on the input fields to directly manipulate that model just yet, so you can like feed it a copy and then the action of the form can send out that copy for you to then apply in the root. So, one, so that was the um, 1.11 upgrading process, just power installing the, uh, the beta. Uh, inline if. This one, let's see. So so that looks like a bit of a, a bit of a bodge. So inline if is simply the ability to use if in a non non block mode, and it looks a little bit lispy. So it's the exact same behavior, but now in an inline form. And that, all on its own, doesn't appear very exciting. But what it allows you to do is, with the new um, attribute binding syntax, which we'll touch on in just a second, um, it will allow you to do things. So previously, when you wanted to bind an attribute of an HTML element, you had to use the bind at a helper. That goes away as of 1.11. And I'll talk about this in the next slide. But Inline if means that you can do things to the effects of foo. Um, much more easily, say, and I'll just. Um, so in the context of that, in the context of a bound attribute, that does make a lot more sense, because you absolutely couldn't use the block form there. So it's, it's uh, it's a feature with a with real tangible benefits. Unlike, unlike my build tooling, which simply breaks all the time. So just to demonstrate that uh, bound attribute. Oh, cool! Oh, let's bump that for a bit. Not cool. Cool. Not cool. Cool. All right, each with index, which uh, I believe Carl just mentioned. So so previously, we had, what, had our each foo in foos form. So we will change that to speaker. And we can also get an index along for the ride, which means that we can find that into our template as well. And the sheer amount of faff in code to just get zero one two. Yeah, previously getting the uh, getting the index in and each basically meant rolling your own helper to do it. Is there a way of making this index index one based? One indexed, yeah. I think yeah, I think probably the best thing to do would be um, have another helper, which is like an add one. <laughs> um, OK, cool. So let's see. Bound attributes. Uh, so this, I touched upon this a little bit already, but. This will be on 111, this one? Still working on 11? Only on 11, yeah. Oh, that's it, it was feature flags on 110. Um, yeah, it didn't land with HTML bars because Matthew Bill was still working on it. But he, he nailed it, I think, a week ago. So it's in 111 for real. So um, yeah, this was the old binding syntax. I've kind of already demonstrated this. Bind at a class, and then you had to, there was like a, another micro syntax inside of that class to get it working properly. And now we can do away with all of that. Do away with the micro syntax and just bind 
exactly like you'd expect to be able to. How was it? Oh, yeah, you're right. Thank you very much. So same. Oh, what did I mess up? Oh, probably. Yeah, I can't remember what I. Uh, oh, yeah, of course. Here, I can miss off the uh, the other half of my else. Oh, I forget what, I, oh, you know, I knew I'd make this mistake. I made this mistake in practice. All right, cool. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, this, we're nearly at the end, I promise. Uh, so this one's quite useful. Um, Going to help. Uh, yeah. So previously, if you wanted to um, render different types of component depending on a key, depending on a you know a property, uh, you would basically just have to put them in a conditional and make do with it. Um, but now we have. So I've defined a component component type computed property here, which is going to decide which component I want uh, I want to use. And in 111, you can use the new uh, component helper, which is going to render whichever component lives in that property. So component type. And these two things should be exactly equivalent. And they are. Uh, so this is actually wrong now. Uh, MSLI. 0.115 just came out. Uh, it runs on IOJS as I'm demonstrating, but beware that um, if you're using SAS, Node SAS does not yet support IOJS. I think it's imminent that they will. Um, and something of interest on the roadmap is that the dream for Ember CLI is that it be a generic ambitious build tool. So the underpinnings will become something that Angular fans can use, React fans can use. The Ember part is going to become a plugin. And there's, if, you, if you check out the RFCs and the roadmap for the project, that's the idea. Extract everything Ember specific out of it. Break it down into micro libraries so that anyone can use it. Uh, Ember data. Now, this I only learned today that there are a bunch of changes to the API for Ember data to make the uh, finding functions more explicit. So uh, it's going from. <laughs> one method called find where you pass it in various different options mean different things to find find all and find query i believe um, this is the current version i assume a new one will ship fairly soon but another interesting thing is that um yehuda katz and dan gebhardt have submitted a um a big patch to the json api spec which simplifies things pretty drastically and it seems to be garnering good feedback, but if anyone's been using JSON API, it would be really worthwhile putting your comments on that pull request, because it, it changes things pretty substantially, but for the simpler in every single case. OK, that's the end of my data blast. On to the talks. <laughs>